What's the most unique campaign that you guys have worked on? I think Be Bolder in itself is the most unique thing we did. Jennifer Schufer, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Marketing and Content Strategy. That's when we also started our digital advertising, and that has really anchored the university in its brand character. When you think about unapologetically proud, mm -hmm. you know, that is what it means to be bolder. It's aspirational. We're not telling you to be this or be that. We're telling you to be yourself in a bold way and to own it. Before we get started, I have to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Open Fortune. Open Fortune created one of the world's most creative, creative ad canvases, the fortune cookie that you know and love by creating partnerships with 47,000 restaurants, reaching 99% of zip codes in a moment that matters. Open Fortune has been working with brands like ZipRecruiter, Chime, Duolingo, Nor Northern Arizona University, uh, Illinois State, as well as many more. So shout out to Open Fortune for renting out the Museum of Ice Cream today making today possible. Hey everybody, and welcome back to How the Fuck Did You Get That Job, where we delve into the career stories of those who've navigated their paths with flair and strategy, and where I, your curious host, unravels the how behind their journeys. Today, we're excited to have Jennifer Schufer, a communications maven in the world of academia. Jennifer laid her academic foundation at Cal Lutheran University with a BA in communications and English. She then delved into the intricacies of linguistics at California State University, San Bernardino. Jennifer's professional journey is a testament to the growth and perseverance. She started her career at Cal Poly Pomona, where she dedicated 12 years of her life evolving through roles that showcased her leadership and communication skills. Her next big leap took her to the University of Colorado Boulder. Starting as an associate director, Jennifer's talent and hard work soon led her to become the director of marketing and communications. But she didn't stop there. For nearly five years now, Jennifer has been excelling as the assistant vice chancellor at the University of Colorado Boulder. So, Jennifer, yeah, how the fuck did you get that job? <laughs> A lot of hard work and perseverance, for sure. Uh, it has been quite a ride and not one that I had laid out step by step, for sure. So growing up, when you were a kid, what was the dream? Well... It probably, I don't know if it was university marketing. It, no, it was not university marketing. Um, I really enjoyed animals. Um, my mom would always yell at me because I'd be fe feeding the stray cats and dogs that would wander they by. They got feelings too. They do. I'm a, I'm a big animal lover. <laughs> so love animals. And I was more in that veterinary veterinarian sort of uh, track, really wanted to do that. And then unfortunately I hit my hit physics and my science uh, dreams died after that. So that's sometimes what happens. It is. When, when you were growing up and you're getting into marketing and brand and stuff, like you're obviously commercials, even like five, six year olds, they know what brand is, even though they don't know what brand necessarily means. What brands and commercials and advertisements were speaking to you that like, you were like, oh, like this made me feel something. Hmm, good question. The first one that pops into into my mind is Kool-Aid and yeah. the big like red yep. um, character that they had. That was uh, one of my favorites for sure. Um, and that's really the only one that's popping up into my head. I've always really enjoyed brands that are around more of a story, uh, sports teams. Um, there's a lot of interest and What's drama around that. Dodgers, LA Dodgers, there for sure. Go. There yeah. you go. So when you were getting into high school and college, right, what was that college decision process look like for you now that you're marketing it, but looking back on it through those lens? So when I was getting ready to go, all I knew growing up was I was going to college. So first generation, um, my mom immigrated to this country. Um, dad has a two-year degree. And so I knew I was going, but there was no real clear trajectory of where. So I applied to a couple schools and I chose Cal Lutheran, one, because they accepted me, two, because my family was moving back to Arizona from Ohio and California was closer uh, than, uh, than Ohio was in, to Arizona. And um, the pastor of the church that we were in in Arizona my family had a good relationship with, and they were like, this is great because he went there. So it wasn't really the kind of choosing and stress that I think a lot of students go through now. Do you think that's changed now where like it used to be more of like, 
a decision by the you know parents, I guess, and now it's both. Or how how are how are kids making decisions at this moment? Or I guess families. I think the intensity level by which the the conversations are happening and the longevity of the conversations is long, it's longer. Um, people are having these conversations, you know, much earlier, sometimes in middle school, mm-hmm. uh, and. And then I think they intensify as a, as a student gets into high school. And there's a lot of pressure on kids mm-hmm. to find the right fit. Um, I think sitting here where I am now, most universities are going to serve just about any student yeah. really, really well. Mm-hmm. And I think it comes down to you know more of size. Some students can really self-advocate mm-hmm. and are good at getting the things that they need so they'll survive in a large school environment and some students need more nudging and so that's where your smaller schools are a little bit more um, comfortable for them and and when you're you're in school and you're studying communications like when do you realize that this is something not only i like but i'm also good at so um i got pushed into business took my macroeconomics Tough. Tough. I yeah, like, I had the same thing. Too short for that conversation. So I switched my major into communications, um, double majored in English because why not? And um, through communications, I really started to gravitate into working in the newspaper. Um, and I like I helped do um, sports stories. Uh, it was before we had programs that did the layout, so I did a lot of cutting and gluing and things like that for the issues. Um, and I could tell I was a good storyteller, was always a really good writer. Even in high school, I wrote for the local community paper. I was like the high school beat uh, mm-hmm. reporter. So always really enjoyed storytelling. And um, I also worked for the director of marketing in my on-campus job was adult degree evening program. And I kind of sat at the front desk and I made coffee for those grownups who were coming back and getting their degree at night while they were also working. And I worked for the director of advertising and I just remember sticking a lot of labels Mm -hmm. on uh, mailers that she would send out and then she would change, like call Joanna uh, if you're interested so she could track the campaign. And so I was Joanna and I was Beverly and I was Beth and I was like all these different people. And that's where I started to really Oh, this is kind of cool. There's a there's a data element. There is a strategy element, um, yeah. and then it's there's all the one creative. Big game. It really yeah. it's yeah. There's and, a lot. And how did you own your like storytelling skills? Was it because obviously you were a good writer to begin with, right? But were there mentors, or was it just like a ten thousand hour rule? I did a lot of foraging on my own and figuring out my craft. Um, but I think part of what I really understand, I like the human aspect of the story, like really trying to get underneath to the why. So from a sports perspective, you know, what does it really feel like to have worked as hard and as long as you have to finally be in this moment? And what are those things? And being able to sort of see which stories to tell um, and then how to tell them. So it's really trying to get at the essence of the of the person and get their story to come to life through the words. Absolutely. So you end up graduating, right? What does that first job out of college look like for, for you? So I did not have something lined up right away. Uh, I actually dropped myself into uh, temp agency work. I was like, well, I have to work, need to make some money. And for those who don't know what temp agency is, to go, I, I know what it is, but. Yeah. So you basically uh, go through an agency to, you know, I, I can answer the phones, do front, uh, front desk work. And for companies that maybe have a gap or someone's on maternity leave or parental leave or whatever, then they will bring a temp in to fill in the gaps mm-hmm. until that person comes sure. back. So I answered a lot of phones and took a lot of meeting notes uh, over the first summer. And uh, we had a Um, my now husband, we had a deadline. If I didn't have a real job (laughs) by Labor Day, we were going to have to move in with his parents. So I was an excellent motivator to get there. Sometimes you need to put put some flame in there. Yeah. And so over the course of summer, I hustled for two jobs. Um, One was with Auto Industry. The other one was with Cal Poly Pomona. I chose the Cal Poly Pomona one, um, mostly because it felt more secure. And they had asked me to 
they didn't have a tour experience, prospective student tour experience, and they did not have an ambassador program built for the university. And so that was really sort of the start of the marketing mm -hmm. um, is build a program, find the students who can be the ambassadors, teach them how to be ambassadors. And so, so that sounds pretty entrepreneurial, yeah. right? Because you had obviously had some skill set of storytelling and such like that. But so how did you go about that and creating that ambassador program and just teaching? Because you're all of a sudden you're managing yourself to managing, I don't know how many ambassadors you had. Yeah, like but 10. Yeah. 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 So how did, how did your leadership style kind of come about from that experience? Again, very much grounded in the human um, aspect of it, that these are people who need guidance. Now, I was 23, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was a big leap to go from, I just graduated from college and two of the ambassadors are two years behind me, right? So they were in their junior year getting ready to, sure. to graduate. So, you know, that in and of itself was an education. Uh, I did have somebody that, you know, was that selected me and I worked with him and he was fantastic. So we were in student affairs. Student affairs uh, by trade is really, a, you know, supporting the student holistically. And so I learned a lot through the vice president and through all the leadership within student affairs. They were very supportive mm -hmm. of um, me being able to ask questions and figure out, you know, like, what is this? What yeah. does this look like? Um, and then just creating it from the ground up, breaking it down with my hindsight glasses, right? You take the big problem and you break it down into really yeah. small, actionable steps um, before, you know, before we all had a sauna, yeah. you did it on yeah, a piece no, of paper and, you know, you handled it in, yeah. in that way. And yeah. that's Next one, action based is everything. Yep. I don't know if you've ever read the book, Getting Things Done. It's like the mm -hmm. worst title ever, but... Uh, it's all about that. It's just yeah. like Asana before Asana. Yes. It's not that you need it exactly now, but um, it was like a wonderful asset for me at least. Uh, what made Kyle Poly uh, Pomona the right place for you for 12 years? And what was the biggest thing you learned from that experience? So part of um, the right fit at the right time was my husband was working on his advanced degree. And so we were close to the Claremont Colleges, Claremont School of Theology. And so he was working on his degrees and um, I was kind of carrying it at, at that point and was the person um, earning the money at that point so he could get the degrees. Um, but what I came to love about Cal Poly Pomona, which is I think recently given the Hispanic serving institution, was that I was working with a population of students who truly had no idea what higher education was. And so it was a blank canvas to work from and how do you shape one a love of higher education and motivate people to know like why and how do you take this big complex thing even though it wasn't very complex in 95 1996 right it, we make it much harder now um, how do you take that complex idea and really break it down in simple ways so that people can understand it and can begin to see themselves in that environment mm -hmm. and i loved that and so i eventually the tour program grew into a visitor center, so I was able to build a visitor center for the university. And um, we started to do things beyond just students who were interested in coming to the university, but we started to do broad group tours mm -hmm. um, and bring small kids. And we had interactive things for them to be able to do to engage in uh, higher education and have positive experience while on campus. Uh, we would bring kids who were getting ready to age out of the foster system bring them to campus and explain how higher education can be a next step for them, even though they don't have people to pay for them to come to college and how, you know, will the university help make it affordable for them to be able to not get a lot of debt, but still be able to earn the degree. So work with a lot of folks in that way. Super, super interesting. So you're touching a lot there and you said like you built a new visitor center, mm -hmm. right? You had all these big projects that necessarily like needed budgets, needed sign off, right? Mm -hmm. In higher ed, how do you go about like identifying the stakeholders, but also pers persuading them that not only is this worth doing, but uh, we should double down on this? Yeah. So I had so many really helpful people who were advocating for me at multiple. It takes a village. It, it really does at multiple levels. Some of it was just dumb luck. Uh, and then the other piece was I have a very um, 
my work ethic is really strong and data. I've always been data driven. And so when I was building the program, I was building the metrics. Which they didn't, we didn't call it metrics then. You know, we just kind of wrote down how many people come in, how many people are calling us, how many people are on the tours, who are they, what do they do afterwards? Like building out a way for sure, us to be able there. to measure yeah. uh, all the pieces. You know, websites were not something you know that came out of a box. They gave me the 800 page. Adobe Go Live book and said, learn how to do this and build a website. I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> just figured out how to build a website. So then we were tracking those things. I did annual reports. So every year I was giving my upline, this is how things are working. This is what's happening. And then we're correlating it to, we have more interest, more applications. Sure. And so that walking the walk or walking the talk really is what got me the money. Mm -hmm. So, and I was, I, they made me a director before I was 30 mm -hmm. and I had people reporting to me, you know, since I was 23 years old. Yeah. And so they, there was a lot of trust that the institution put into me, but they also invested a lot in me as well. Yeah. Whether I knew good. it then, I, like I didn't understand what they sure, were doing sure, sure. then, but with the hindsight glasses, you're like, oh, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it does take a, a group of people and it takes belief to feel where me and uh, the, our CRO, we were talking just like, you need to not only trust them, but it's like to trust Then, If you don't trust them, they're not going to feel empowered and then they might not do a good job or they're going to be stagnant and not one like yeah. paralysis by analysis. But so back to your story, after 12 years, you end up deciding to go to Boulder. Um, what what did that decision process look for, like for you and your family? Because it seems like they were obviously involved uh, in, in a move. Yep. So it was really by happenstance. So my sister and her husband had moved to Colorado from Arizona State University. And I was flipping through the Chronicle because we had actual paper copies when I was flipping. And I saw the ad for the director of recruitment. And I saw Colorado and I was like, oh. That's kind of interesting. Have this, you been to Boulder yet? No. Well, that's a lie. I did. Um, I helped move my sister um, there. Um, her husband took the moving van and then I rode with her. And we actually, my first, um, when we got there, it was 4th of July weekend and we actually did the fireworks at Folsom Field. Very cool. And so that was my first time ever on campus. Yeah. Uh, a little foreshadowing, right? Um, and then... I threw my hat in the ring. I, I wasn't really looking for anything. Um, Cal Poly Mona had always been really good to me. Um, my husband was starting to teach, you know, in different different universities around uh, Southern California. Um, so I was like, eh, I don't have anything to lose. Sure, why not? Why not, right? And so threw the hat in the ring and lo and behold, nine months later, we had picked up our two-year-old and our four-year-old and moved out to Colorado. And what were the pain points that they were looking for you to resolve mm. for them? So when I got to the admissions office. And what year was it? 2006. Okay. So when I got to the admissions office, I had 30 people that were going to report to me. I had the application operation, visits, call center, front desk, all the travel. And I hadn't done that before. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't in the admissions office. I was the visitor center, visitor and information centers at Cal Poly Pomona. And those two differ just from a, from the visitor centers more, you could tell me. The visitor center was more of a place where prospective and current students could get help and information on how to navigate the university. Mm -hmm. Admissions is more, Perspective or it's the application yeah, process. Application, yeah. And that's really where like visitor centers were, were beginning to kind of grow into something like we need a point place for families and students to go in order to start the journey. Mm -hmm. And just because you know how to process an application and receive a transcript and doesn't mean that you all should be the front door of the university. Mm -hmm. And so this whole concept of being a front door to the university started to grow. So there's an organization called the Collegiate Information Visitor Services Association. It's okay. mouthful, yeah. CIVSA. Um, that was just starting as I was doing the visitor center stuff at Cal Poly. And I was one of their regional directors at the very beginning of the organization. And that's where we started to kind of pull apart and think about admissions as a broader experience and introduction into the university. 
and it was tucked into student affairs because student sure. affairs handles the entire I'm sure student every, experience. every university is mapped out in a different way. There were very few campuses that were beginning visitor centers. And so there was that that was a thing, I would say, in the early 2000 to 2010, yeah. people were really trying to figure out yeah. how do I get a visitor center or a once, not a one stop shop, yeah. but a visitor center place to start. So over your time, you've obviously seen this brand grow and you're inheriting a brand. Like, how have you seen it change from when you came in to where it is now? Yeah. So like what were people saying before and now what are people saying now? About yeah. Yours? So we didn't have the boulder. When I got there, um, we had something like mines to match our mountains or something like Scobus. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so not even school buffs that came, really? that was more as social media started to like really take off um, because it hadn't at this point. Um, admissions didn't have uh, a communications team. It didn't have social media channels. It had a good web presence. We had some folks in the central unit that had done some really good work with mm -hmm. web, um, but we didn't have like marketing, marketing mm -hmm. that was happening. And so in addition to the other work that I did, what I was trying to help admissions do was to unflatten it's organization because having 30 people report to one person is not yeah, bottlenecks, right? So that, that kind of, um, didn't help. So we started to create and reshape the office, uh, in a way where we could then start to think about the work that needed to be done. Um, and so the brand, like the essence or the character of the brand is still the same. There is something very, and how do you define that pioneering about Colorado? Yeah. Boulder is uh, very entrepreneurial, very innovative. There's a lot of research labs and startups, and there's an energy to taking things like from discovery and, um, and sending it wherever you're gonna send it and bring back and then process the learning. The example we use is space. We have one of the, one of the top, um, we get the, a lot of money from NASA. And I can't remember if we're one or two, but the yeah. amount of money we get per year for NASA is huge. And we sent instruments to every planet in uh, the universe. Like that's kind of what we do in, in the solar system. And um, students are working on those sorts of things. And so it's, it's this very entrepreneurial energy that yeah. comes from the institution. And we didn't have that captured from a marketing perspective. And the chancellor had selected a group of folks from across. I represented in the enrollment management space and then athletics was there. A lot of different folks, the strategic relations, the communications team, and our team worked together to figure out what should a unifying message platform be. And that's how Be Boulder came about. And that has really anchored the university in its brand character. When you think about unapologetically proud, mm -hmm. you know, that is what it means to be Boulder. It's aspirational. It's, you can, you, we're not telling you to be this or be that. We're telling you to be bold, like be yourself in a bold way and to own it. Totally. And what's the biggest challenge that you faced in this role? Uh, admissions was always led. We were always right on the bleeding edge. And so once we got approval that we could move the Be Boulder messaging platform into production, admissions was first. And so I had to lead the team in developing all the materials that admissions produces. We had about four or five months, um, everything from posters to pens to view books and everything had to move from the old way of doing things into how do we bring Be Boulder to life in a visual way? How do we bring it to life through words? Um, how do we take pictures differently? Um, how do we really, you know? Yeah. What's the most unique campaign that you guys have worked on uh, since your time there? I think Be Boulder in, a, in itself is the most unique thing we did. So starting that, it, that's when we also started our digital advertising. Like we had never done paid advertising prior to Be Boulder. And we launched that. I mean, it's, it was really exciting to be at that point of 
participating in the launch. Like I wasn't leading it. That was my counterpart in strategic relations. Um, but admissions was definitely in the sidecar because we were going first. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, that, that I, th I think would be really, it was really exciting to be mm -hmm. part of it. And the positive reaction to Be Boulder from prospective students, because we started measuring every year to see how are we changing the way people are thinking about us um, on an annual basis. And it is overwhelmingly every, from gender, from diversity, yeah. age, demographic, like where you live in the country, like it doesn't translate super well <laughs> in, internationally yeah. um, for folks who are translating people. Sure, sure. Uh, and that's kind of fun, but, um, but it really does test really, really well and people feel inspired by it. Yeah, and, and you raised a family in Colorado, right? You, you've been at Boulder for a while. Why have you stayed there so long and what made it the right place then, but also now? Mm and in the future. Yeah. So I've always enjoyed that startup feel and um, that's what I keep being offered uh, is, you know, from a bigger university too, which is unique. Well, like, so I came in as a associate director for recruitment, but then they said, hey, we want you to develop a marketing team that's embedded within the startup, right? So how are you going to do that? And then we want you to um, now do this, but bring it into the central. And we would like you to do this for current students. So instead of focusing on recruitment, we want you to focus on persistence. And so how can you bring to bear what you've learned in the recruitment space and help students stay through to graduation? And how do you connect the data, the content, and the technology in order to do all of those pieces? And that is what I'm in the middle of right now. And it's that's hugely that's satisfying great. and yeah. hard and fun. That's amazing. And we spoke about your career a lot, but also would love to talk about your personal life. Uh, what are you super proud of uh, that you've accomplished or that you're working on on the personal side? Well, I think I, the work that I've done being a mom yeah. in relation to um, like raising kids, but also continuing to move my career forward um, is both very challenging um, but also rewarding at the same time. And they've been um, a hoot and hard, uh, which they know. And um, it's just kind of... Give them a shout out. <laughs> a shout out to EJ and uh, Nene. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Uh, I think that's a good place to wrap and we'll hit the lightning round and yeah. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. So got to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Open Fortune. Open Fortune took over the fortune cookie as a media platform. Fun story, I was Googling fortune cookie two days ago when we landed in Chicago. There was a story about a 16 year old girl who was a D1, is a D1 volleyball player, was trying to make her commitment. She was deciding between Idaho State, which is close at home, as well as going to Virginia. She got a fortune cookie that said, you don't have to go far to be successful. And then she put on her hat for the Idaho State. So kind of crazy. Uh, and let's see uh, if these can tell our future. You want to open one oh, with me? Yes, with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go first. Okay. I can do it. All right. You will find the rewards you seek in a familiar place. And then what you got in the back? Stables. There you go. Cool. The rewards you see at Boulder. Familiar. Start, start today. The reward, another reward one, will be life changing. Northern Arizona University. Go Lumberjacks. Nice. There we go. That's where Sweet. my sister went. Oh, yeah? Yep. I've never been to Flagstaff, but I've heard it's the best. It's cool. Yeah. Good planetarium. Yeah. Have you been to Flagstaff or no? Yeah. You? Nope. No. It's a good place. Uh, person you most want to sit down to dinner with, dead or alive? Jenna Bark. Favorite city in the world? I'm not lightning. Sorry. Um, oh, good. Let's say Rome. If you were to be given a million dollars to create a movie, what would it be about? It'd probably be a story about someone who's overcome something to do something amazing. Underdog story. There it is. There you go. Uh, is it okay to sleep with socks on? No. Damn. Uh, <laughs> favorite rom-com? I'm bad at this. Sandra Bullock. Yep. The one where she is the... If you give me the plot. 
Yep, I'm trying to get there. She was the cop, and they like made her beautiful. Miss Congeniality. Miss Congeniality. Yeah. <laughs> yep. In 40 years, what will people be nostalgic for? Chat GPT. <laughs> there we go. I mean, I'm so not nostalgic for it yet. But uh, in one sentence, how would you sum up the internet? Big. What's one thing people don't understand about college marketing? Working in college marketing. That the trade-off for the salary is better boundaries around your work and your non-work life. That's clear. In 10 years, where can we catch you? 2033. Probably still at Boulder. There's a lot of work to be done. Sweet. And it's a lot of fun. Amazing. Well, I'll see you at Boulder and hopefully Prime will be the coach still. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it'd be great. Amazing. Thank you very Thank much you for, having for having me. Having yeah. Sweet.